the Beatles from the beginning to the end. It's their solo careers. It's their humor. It's their incredible music. It's the British invasion. It's their American adversaries. It's an historical musical education. It's the Beatles and a whole lot more. A Beatles fan's paradise. It's Beatlesarama.com. Tune in. You'll love it. Okay, welcome to Tomorrow Never Knows with me, Bob Wilson, and Sir Warren Brown of the Beatles Kingdom. Our extra special guest today is Mr. Ken Mansfield, head of Apple Records USA and respected author. Also joining us is author and Beatles pal of ours, Phil Weathers. Lend us your ears and we'll take you up on the roof. Welcome to the show, Ken. Great to be here, Rob. <laughs> All right. Okay, we're, we're, we're in a happy mood already, aren't we? Uh, Absolutely. Yes, sir. <laughs> so I understand that May 8th will be a very special anniversary that is dear to your heart. Uh, what's coming up on May 8th? Uh, well, May 8th is the 50th anniversary of the Let It Be album release. And uh, on May 13th it will be the, the uh, uh, 50th anniversary of the film. And uh, I think the reason why this is so special because if you think about it, these are the last legitimate 50th anniversary for, in quotation, the Beatles. Uh, everything after this, that the 50th anniversary, will not include all of them as a foursome. Now, correct me if, if you will, but that's my, that's kind of my emotional feel on the thing that this is is the a unique 50th anniversary for them. Uh, I don't think there'll be any more, unless there's something I don't know which is really possible. So as Let It Be was being made, uh, what was the feeling within Apple as it was being made? What was your perception of it? Did it change over time? Like what did you, when they brought it up, the projects in, in swing, what came your way? What were you thinking? Well, I think <clears throat> Paul's intention, uh, well, Paul, um, the band's intention, but Paul seemed to have the uh, lead in the attitude of what they were doing. But um, he wanted this to be very organic. And I think it became or more organic in another way that it seemed to have his own life, <laughs> untouched by, um, let's say, uh, outside chemical. Well, okay, that's no good, no good. <laughs> but uh, I just think it, it kind of grew on its own. It grew through, uh, through dissension, through creativity, through change of uh, what they were intended to do. Uh, it grew on its own, and uh, it became what it became because of all the different things that entered into it. Uh, the plan was never simple, and then I think it got uh, maybe more complicated from there. But the one goal, that the solid goal was making the film, was that they were going to close with a live performance, you know, by the Beatles, and which had been about two years since they had played together. So that was. That was the one thing, make the music, record it, get a live feeling out of it, and then do a live concert. So they hadn't been touring in a while, and um, this was going to be a selling point for the movie, I guess, this live performance. So I guess that was key to the plot, uh, to the release from what you're saying. So as they discussed how to play, was there one idea? Did a few ideas come up? How did they settle on the roof? Oh, well, that's pretty uh, simple, is the fact that the whole idea was to do something really unique. So there were probably maybe 30, 30 different uh, ideas about where they would go, everything from the Colosseum to a Greek island to uh, a flour mill to, uh, the I think, um, what do they call the uh, Hall of Congress there, whatever it is, uh, you know, just a million different things. In fact, I got a call in L.A. from Mal Evans and saying that they had asked Mal to call me if I would scope out uh, a southwestern, you know, uh, desert. And Mal was assigned to scope out a place maybe in the Sahara Desert. And with the concept being that they would just set up in the middle of the desert someplace and then announce that they were going to play a free concert for everybody in the world. Uh, that's kind of how, maybe to me, that was in a way the most far-fetched idea of the different ideas that, um, were brought forward, but um, I mean, think about this. If they would have set up in the desert someplace, 
and thrown a free concert for every kid in the world, uh, think how many people would have showed up and think how many people would have maybe not been able to get back home afterwards. Uh, and we, we joke about it because uh, they think, well, it's a kind of a bad idea logistically, and uh, who would ever want to underwrite the insurance on that thing? But I think the main thing on that particular one was uh, how could you get that many porta potties out there? You know, so <laughs> anyway, uh, but the uh, the roof was uh, now here I am. I'm in L.A. and I'm involved. I'm being asked you know, to be part of this. Now, just by happen chance that I was in London during the filming, there was no plan there. I had no idea. I just had business. I would go to London and work out of the offices there sometime. And uh, Mal comes down to the office I was using and said, hey, Ken, we're going up on the roof in 15 minutes. And I said, what do you mean we're going up on the roof? He said, that's where we're going to do the, the concert for the film. And I thought, you know what? They'll call me in L.A. and involve me in this project from there but now i'm you know i'm down the hall and nobody even tells me anything so uh that and the idea in my understanding all these are things are my understanding of how it was the fact that it was getting so complicated trying to work out a place and all the logistics of it and all the technicalities of just having a place like that and then the cost of transporting the equipment and the workers and the unions and having all four Beatles want to go to that trouble themselves and be together for the period of time. And it just, uh, it just was falling under its own weight. And eventually uh, Michael Lindsay Hogg was out of time because this was supposed to be the end of the film and they were down to that. So uh, I'm, I'm sitting in the office in London. I'm hearing some construction going on, but I figured, well, it's, you know, it's a five story building. So there's a lot of offices. So I just figured, that um, they were just maybe remodeling somebody's office. But uh, I don't know uh, when it was decided. It was really, in essence, my understanding, it was pretty much a last-minute thing. And then up on the roof, was it chilly? Did you have to buy some extra clothing to be up there? <laughs> was it chilly up there? Uh, let's see. Uh, as a friend of mine said, this is not a rocket surgery to figure out how cold it would be up there. <laughs> on that roof this is you know at the, at the end of uh january uh five top of five story building yes it was cold and it was windy but uh i was not prepared for that because uh, i was used to coming in from la and because of the way i would travel you know i'd get off the plane and be picked up and get out of the uh, baggage picked up immediately in a rolls royce limousine or something taken straight to the hotel i'm outside for you know, 20 seconds getting to the hotel and then coming back and getting from the to the limo to the office was another 35 seconds as far as being outside. So I just wore what I wore. I didn't ever worry about dressing for winter that much. So uh, I ran out. When I was, Mal told me that, so I got 15 minutes. So I just ran out. Fortunately, I was on Savile Row, which is tailors and men's stores and things like that. And just went to the first place. Now, there's a place next door. I don't know if I went there, but, boy, I went to some place pretty close. And I think I grabbed something. It was either like when you walk through the door on a rack right there or was in the window or something. I just grabbed this white coat. It was my size and just bought it and ran back. <laughs> and uh, when I got up on the roof, uh, it was cold up there. And basically what I what I really bought was more of a uh, – raincoat type thing as opposed to a warm top coat so i got up on the roof and that thing was rubberized somehow and boy it was just stiff as a board i could have walked away from that just left it you know standing there but uh, <laughs> as i told somebody i don't care how cold it was up there you could have hosed me down with ice water and i wouldn't have left once that whole thing started now who was anyway, sitting it was a white coat by the way uh to as fully, fully answer your question it was a white coat and uh of course, now I'm up there, and the only color up there besides black and dark blue is George's green pants and Ringo's red jacket. So, I mean, I stood out, <laughs> you know. So uh, I'm waiting for the film because I understand uh, Peter Jackson is going to use a lot of footage. In fact, I remember somebody said he was going to do the whole 42 minutes. I'm not sure about that, but I hope to see myself a little bit more. It's going to be easy to find me, <laughs> the man in the white coat. With the white coat. 
So who were uh, up on in the audience with you? Who were you sitting with watching the show? Well, that's funny you use the word audience because that's what we decided we were because uh, there wasn't much room up on the roof. It was a small roof, and they had built the um, – uh, not scaffolding, but the floor, big planks to make that floor, which is only about 12 by 20 feet maybe. And so I call that the sweet spot because the Beatles were at one end with uh, Billy Preston and, and the band there facing out to the street. And there was a chimney. And I was uh, with Yoko and Maureen, Ringo's wife, and Chris O'Dell, who was Peter Asher's assistant, and we're sitting right in front of them, about four to six feet away. And uh, so we were the audience. Everybody else was uh, had a job there. It was a sound man or the film people or the band. Uh, there wasn't really room weight-wise or room-wise for much more. Now, there were people around the edges. And uh, when some of the, the films you see or some of the photographs, it looks like there's a lot of people there. But that, a lot of these pictures have people from the adjoining building and so the perspective, because you lose the depth of perception, was that there's a lot of people, but there was only four people up there that were not working. And uh, so we were, the, us four were the audience. And as I say, we had uh, good seats and we were comped. So <laughs> uh, anyway, um, and a lot of people in Apple, by the way, did not even know that this was happening either. So uh, if they'd have known, a lot of the workers or a lot of you know, people would have tried to tried to get up there, but they would have been able to. And so that's why, you know, Ron Cass is up there and Jack Oliver and and uh, Peter Brown and Mal Evans. There were some some people up there, but uh, it was a pretty uh, pretty amazing thing. And I have no idea how I end up being one of the people up there outside of you know a Beatles lady or wife or whatever. But um, to me, it had to do with Mal. Mal and I had such a beautiful relationship. And I think Mal just wanted me to see it. And so he gave me a heads up and went up with him. Um, what happened when uh, the police came up on the roof? Um, was there anything going on? Were they trying to shut you down, um, stop the concert from happening? Okay. From my vantage point, and this is something that always uh, kind of interested me, it was not a big deal with the with the police up there. Um, it was it wasn't that dramatic. It wasn't like uh, it was scary in any way, or like we were being heavy busted. Or, I mean, they were being heavy busted or anything like that. Mm -hmm. um, and then afterwards, when I found out more about Mal's part in this, where he re basically. Uh, the door, he, you know, he had locked the door to downstairs because uh, when we got ready to start, because so nobody could get in the building and get up there. But uh, when the Bobbies came, he answered, and my understanding is that he basically smoothed, you know, smoothed them and uh, look, I'm going to let you come up. Uh, I think it was just a couple guys, but you got to, you know, you're going to get to see something special and you're going to be with the Beatles for a little while. And just work with me here because we got so much, you know, footage or, yeah, that we want to get. And so if you'll notice in the film that they're standing there, there's nobody, you know, hitting anybody with a billy club or you know, shutting the thing down until a certain point. And so I think that's been over dramatized. And what's interesting about it is I've done interviews with the BBC where the fellow, I think it was Ken Worf, uh, was uh, in an interview with me and Michael Lindsay Hogg and Kevin, Kevin Harrington, who was up on the roof, and somebody else. And all the questions went to the, to the, to the policeman. <laughs> More people wanted to know about the, the policeman and what his part was. And he just went on and on and on. And the rest of us are kind of sitting around and, and uh, the whole, <laughs> whole five-man, uh, or whatever you call it, group, that for the interview was sat around listening to the policeman. That's what everybody wanted to hear. When the police got to the roof, Mal Evans was um, talking with them and um, uh, trying to explain to them what was going on and everything. Uh, what was being said and done at that time? Do you, do you recall? Yeah, well, just exactly that. I think he was almost, 
And, you know, it, there's no way I could hear what he was saying with them and anything like that. But it was probably like, like OK, well, look, we got to do a couple more songs. And, <laughs> you know, and I think it was almost like then he said, OK, go ahead, you know, do it now or whatever. But, you know, you could tell it was uh, very cordial between right. them. And uh, they were really lucky because they got to be up there. And, and Mal, you know, was if you knew Mal at all, he was just a big, lovable teddy bear. And now if Neil Aspinall would have been down there and met him at the door, I think it would have been a whole different story because Neil was a bit more um, forceful and crusty, shall we say, about things. Mm-hmm. But Mal just, um, uh, he just befriended him in a matter of a few minutes. And, and uh, I think that's why the concert got to go as long as it did. Because there was a lot of, you know, later I found out just how much problems there were down below from the businessmen and and stuff like that. They wanted this thing shut down because it did not fit the demeanor of Savile Row, especially all the bankers and investors and and the up, upscale tailors and tailors and their uh, you know their clientele. Right. Um, so there was a lot of pressure, and the police station was just was just down the road a little bit. wasn't really that far away, so they could have really sent a lot of people up there. But uh, I just think it's amusing. Uh, just how kind of kind of that's been played up, and now it's the fact that somebody said, well, that was considered that uh, yes, do have an arrest and it'll make more news, be a big deal. But I don't see how anybody had time to discuss that unless they would something they discussed beforehand. But you know, I didn't see Peter Brown and Cass and and uh, Ringo and somebody like huddling to discuss. Well, should we be arrested or shall we not? You know. Right. Well, I'm going to ask you about your friend Mal Evans in just a second, but uh, can you uh, go on about the songs that were played up on the roof and how they came about um, making a playlist or or practicing or anything like that? I don't have a clue. I don't know how that... That's another part of me saying I think it was very organic. I don't know. I don't, you know... You all know who Mark Lewison is, and uh, Mark is probably one of the greatest Beatle historians of our time. And and he said, Ken, we were talking once, he said, he said, if you don't know the answer in a Beatles interview, he said, just say you don't know, because you've got people out there that know everything. Exactly. So, you know, <laughs> so I, you know, I, I don't really, uh, there's things I was privy to and things that I wasn't privy to. Um, and there's things also for me, I'm not a real good person with detail. I can remember the emotion on the roof. I can remember what the wind felt like. I can remember uh, Chris and I and the four of us sitting there and kind of huddling against the uh, the chimney. By the way, people said, well, at least you guys are up against this you know, chimney to stay warm. Well, that chimney was not a – it wasn't a <laughs> functional thing. You know, It wasn't a bunch of fireplaces were burning down below in the, in the building. So it was just really a windbreak for us. But right. uh, I could just remember uh, – the how we all just got really quiet and something was happening you know it was just the that's what i want the uh like the people want to read the my book the roof is that they get this feeling of what it was like to walk through the door of apple and to go up the stairs and be with the people and be go up on the roof i just want to get the because there's such great writers you know beetle historians and people that really know the details and uh I'm just kind of a, a fly by the seat of my pants I'm type of guy and just absorb them the, the times um, for what they were to me it, just as, as special times. Right. Yeah, that's great. Um, rooftops of buildings aren't known to be all that sturdy. What <laughs> did you think about all the weight uh, from all the equipment and the people walking around up there? Where um, were you scared that the roof was going to fall in or anything? Well, that was definitely one of the things um, that was taken into consideration. And that's why, first of all, probably they didn't, didn't really let anybody in the building know except the people that we should know about going up there. And that's why they had to you know, put these heavy planks and build a, a floor up there. And even down the next store floor down was a Peter Asher's office was right underneath that and they had actually taken uh, beams and stuff and 
supported the, the the next floor down underneath it because of the weight that was going to be up there. Mm-hmm. And uh, so, but even though they did take precaution, um, somebody uh, told me that that was in the building that they didn't do any um, research or any uh, technical testing or whatever the words would be, you know, stress tests or anything like that. Uh, mm-hmm. They didn't, there still was a very hap- hap- haphazard thing and mm-hmm. probably on paper that roof would have caved in with the people up there that was up there. Wow. That's amazing. All right. I want to talk a little bit about your friend, Mal Evans. Um, do you have any thoughts on him? His uh, anniversary of his death was just recently and you came on the show and did a little tribute to him. Um, can you tell us your thoughts on Mal Evans? Mal Evans, uh, <clears throat> for me, there was something so immediate that clicked about a friendship. It was such a deep friendship. And it really, to me, as I back away from the Beatles and everything that went on, the thing that comes to the top, the cream that rises to the top, as far as the thing is Mal. Uh, I cannot really um, think of the Beatles without thinking of Mal. And the first time that I met them and worked with them was in, uh, when they did the 1965 tour and, and came to LA. And um, so they invited me. They hadn't really think, I don't think they had had a day off on their previous tour in uh, LA. And they had a day off and they just wanted to know things about California. And uh, so they invited me up to the house, I believe it was in Benedict Canyon and uh, it was had walls around it and the big pool. And uh, so Mal and I just got to hang out right away that day. And uh, if, if you could have seen it, what it was like, because the walls were about, probably about eight or 10 feet high. And uh, there were kids actually scaling the wall like they were, you know, <laughs> in, in the Second World War scaling. <laughs> you know? but, and, uh, and Mal would just go around. He was having a great time. He had this garden hose and as they clear the wall and start trying to come down the other side mal would just hose them down you know and, <laughs> well. and then as, as he's hose, ho- hosing him down then uh, the security would just come and get him and take him right back out and they hardly have a chance to turn around and wave or anything like that or even get a good shot of the beetles they're being hosed down and hauled off and but <laughs> one thing that was the greatest thing that happened that day was somebody made it over the wall and uh, Paul was sitting there in a beach, you know, lounge by the pool. And he turns to the guy. The guy, you know, looks there and he's seeing the Beatles. And Paul raises, up, raises his hand and says, hey, how you doing? Or something like that. Hi, you know. And it was like shooting the guy with a tranquilizer gun. He was so, <laughs> he was so stunned to have Paul say something to him. He just kind of melted. <laughs> you know? Wow, that's amazing. Uh, you you two had a, a great relationship. Um, it, oh yeah, I forgot to answer your question. I apologize. That that's all right. You can go ahead. <laughs> no, it's just um, that was the beginning, and then uh, we worked together again the next year. And when it came time uh, to do the Apple thing, uh, now I'd worked with them on two tours, and then Paul and Cass came over. Uh, and, you know, because now I'd moved way up in the company. And uh, so I was part of putting it together from the capital end and having the first meetings when Paul and Cass came over. And, and uh, you know, we announced that we were going to be having capital. was going to just distribute them. But they went back. And I honestly think, and Paul and Cass were the ones that made the decision because, you know, Larry Delaney uh, was a part of um, – the team too from capital. And I actually thought we, he and I weren't competing for the job. In fact, we didn't even know there was going to be a job. And in my mind, it would have been more logical for them to pick Larry. He just seemed to be more, uh, more Ron Cass's type. And Ron was very dear to me, but um, I think Mal, because we seem to get just hit it off. I think Mal always spoke so highly of me that he, the Beatles listened to him, and I think because he okayed me, I think it had a lot to do with them okaying me. I think it really made a big difference in my relationship with them. 
because of Mal's Mal's feeling. I've, I've always believed that 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 was the reason why it went so well with me with the guys. Anyway, Mal and I were just. Uh, it was a, a beautiful friendship, and then when everything was over, and Mal, you know, left the Beatles too and came to L.A., uh, it was he. He would he crashed at my place, and the next thing I know, I've got Lil and the kids there. <laughs> I've got this house full, and and uh, somebody, uh, who was it? Was it Jack Oliver, or I guess it was Jack Oliver and Rod Stewart's girlfriend? And pretty soon, my whole house is full of these uh, British people. <laughs> and, and I'm looking for a place to sleep, you know, on, on, the, on the couch or something, because of every room is just filled up with. But anyway, uh, Mal, our relationship, you know, continued. Mal had a rough time there in L.A. because it was really hard to come off of all the stuff, you know, that he had with the Beatles and then to kind of be on his own a little bit. Right. And so to make this story complete, uh, I was... Uh, I was producing Waylon Jennings and Jesse Coulter at that time. And I had a number one country record and top five pop record with Jesse Coulter with a song called I'm Not Lisa. And Billboard was having, I think it was their first award show. And Jesse was up for uh, new female country artist of the year. And so they asked me because Jesse was on the road. If she won, would I accept the award on her behalf? And so I'm sitting at home getting ready to go. I'm working on a record I was working uh, on, too, also doing some uh, sequencing. And Mal calls me. And he said, hey, what you doing, man? I said, oh, I'm getting ready to go, get ready to go to this Billboard Award. And he I said, how you doing, man? And he said, oh, I'm doing great. Because I was this and Paul, Paul's going to do this. And we're going to, and well, by the way, they're giving me. And I said, Mal, uh, is something wrong? And he goes, no, no, no. And Atlantic Records, I think, oh, he said, my book, book's really going good, and you're really going to like my book. And and I said, Mal, something's wrong. He, he just keeps going on how great everything is. And I said, Mal, something wrong, isn't it? And he goes, like this silence, and he goes, yeah. And I said, I'm I'm, I'm committed. I've, I've got to go here in a few minutes. But if you want me to get together with you later? He said, well, no. I said, well, let's just meet for lunch at Musso Frank's tomorrow, okay? And he said, yeah, we'll do that. Hung up the phone, went to the banquet, and just sit there announcing that uh, Jesse Coulter won. I'm starting to walk up to the stage, and Diane Bennett, who wrote for The Hollywood Reporter at the time, came up and she put her hand on my shoulder and said, oh, Ken, I'm sorry about Mal. Now I'm walking up the step, and Flip Wilson is up there. He's the MC, and he's holding the reward the award, the statue, uh, mm. like to hand it to me for me to take it. And I'm looking over my shoulder at Diane going, what do you mean, Mal? What do you mean, Mal? You know? And uh, so I had to go up there and I, I can't remember what I said. It was like a dream, mumble, 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 mumble. And I came back down and rushed to Diane. I said, what do you, what do you mean about Mal? And he said, well, he's been shot. And uh, I can't remember. She said, told me that, that killed at that time or I found within like an hour or so that he died. But... Um, that's that was the end. So it turns out, you know, it was I was one of the last people to talk to him because I don't know what time after I talked to him, you know, before it happened, how long it was after that or who we talked to after that. Wow. Wow. Yeah. No, that's that's a bad way to, to get that kind of message. I can imagine the way you felt. Oh. I can imagine. Yeah. I, yeah. And of course, Harry Nielsen jumped in and took care of everything, and I I don't even know what happened after that. I think he took Mal's ashes back to London or something. It was just a it was a blur. Yeah, I can imagine. I'm going to ask you one more uh, question, and I'm going to hand it over to Phil to see if he's got anything to ask and, and talk to you a little bit um, okay. with the. With the anniversary of Let It Be coming up, first of all, did you see the old film? And what would you think it would be the differences with the new film compared to the old? Well, my understanding, uh, first of all, we know that both Paul and Ringo have voiced very favorable uh, views on this. And even Donnie Harrison, I guess, has either seen mm -hmm. clips or something from it. But um uh, the Michael Lindsay Hogg film 
was a film of the time, and uh, it, it was very dark in a way, but that was very cool. And I think he took a very, uh, he took a certain point towards it, and I cannot re- criticize at all what he did. Um, it was a little dark and it was, it was negative, but uh, the, my understanding is Peter Jackson has all oh, so much footage and so much recording and stuff to work from, and that he is going to take. He has taken a very positive attitude towards it. It's going to be much more. It's going to be colorful, and um, to think about it, you know, here's you know Peter Jackson. Just think about the films he does. What he does is, you know, incredible director. And I think with all the technology he has, and mm. with his attitude is showing, showing a more positive thing. I'm just I can't wait to see it. Everybody calls it a documentary, which it is. But I think my opinion is when I see it, it's going to look like a film, like a you know, like an epic or something. That's just what I think is going to happen. Right. I'll leave something for Phil here, you guys. <laughs> okay, Ken, this I'm is sorry. Phil. Okay, I just I'm going back to the rooftop. Just a couple questions about the rooftop. How many people I know, you know, in seeing the the film, uh, the one that's already out there. There's a number of people on the uh, ground looking up. How many people would you estimate could actually see the Beatles looking out, you know, windows from other buildings? Were there that many people that could actually see them, not just hear them, but could see them? Well, you know, um, we couldn't see the street and they couldn't see the the building. So everybody that was down below on the street None of them could see. All the most they could see was on the very edge that was facing the street was a camera set, you know, set up there and maybe a couple uh, technicians. But uh, when we first started, of course, there was nobody up there. But once the band started playing, it was weird because it was like all of a sudden the building next door, some people started coming up onto their roof and people started opening windows and people were on fire escapes and people were on ledges and so i don't know um maybe if i said 20 30 50 probably somewhere between closer to 30 people maybe could actually see it from up there now there was a building across the street that um the cover um, of my book was taken from across the street and um and so Apple didn't own that particular picture, but there may have been more people over there. I don't know why I didn't notice, but mainly we could just see the, what was happening on the roof to the adjacent buildings. The buildings touched each other. They weren't like, you know, a space between them or something like that. Um, so there were quite a few people, and probably totally before it was done, maybe closer to 50 people if you count kind of everybody. I never counted them, never even thought about it. But uh, right. Ringo, uh, and I read this, so this is firsthand, but I understand that he kind of got in the groove back there and was enjoying watching the the audience, the ones that could see him, that he was kind of enjoying playing for them, I guess. He, he played for the people that could see. Yeah, that's great. Um, what did, when when they finished playing, what what did the, what did the Beatles do right after they finished uh did they congratulate each other did they go separate ways what what happened after all this was over good question i made a, a comment not a, a, a learned comment before that when they got done they went through the door and went downstairs to the I don't know, the tunnel there was no hanging hanging about or like you said you know high-fiving or congratulating and Yoko and I and Chris and uh, Maureen just filed down after him. And I, I got the impression that maybe John and Yoko just went down and got in the limo and left. Uh, George went off to his office or something. Um, and the four of us didn't even talk about it. And there's a re- reason for that is because something had happened that none of us were expecting. When I tell people, well, was it was just another day at the office, they, they look at me like I'm daft, you know. But it was like another day at the office. It was some footage that needed to be done for the film. 
there was always something happening in the building, whether it was the Hare Krishnas or the Hells Angels or famous movie actors or, you know, songwriting or down in the basement studio or something. There was just always something going on. And so this was just um, really, in a way, another day in the office. It was just something that was done. But when this thing started, when they started playing, and I was also told that they hadn't decided for sure to do it right up until they were virtually standing on the other side of the door on, and it goes onto the roof, deciding almost uh, whether they would go on or not. And uh, I, I, I was told somebody said, yeah, John said, let's just go do it. But there was a lot of dissension, a lot of things going down, just so much. But when they started playing, something happened and you know you can see in the film someplace where paul looks over at john and john looks at paul and it was kind of like yeah this is us this is who we are you know we've been together for so many years we've been good mates we've created a lot of great music we've had all this success but the heart of it is we were a good live band and uh yeah this is us and they played that thing up there You've heard the raw tapes, probably just how good they are yeah. for the conditions, and which Alan Parsons, you know, really deserves credit because he was fighting the wind and everything else up there, and things happening so fast. But uh, they just uh, they were rocking out, and the thing for me is because you know I was I was with them really specifically during the White Album and the Let It Be album. That was the main thing when I was working with them, not when I was at Capitol working on their product. But um, this uh, this thing that happened that day, I think is, my opinion, is maybe one of the reasons, you know, part of the reasons that they were able to, able to go back and do Abbey Road. Because for me, with the White Album and Let It Be, with a lot of individuality, but when it came to Abbey Road again, it, it felt more like the Beatles, you know? Mm-hmm. All four guys have had more of that feeling to it. And I think maybe that day on the roof uh, was a part of that because they got to feel that again. Um, I've written seven books, and there's one line in this in the roof that, is, to me, was my favorite line I've ever written. And I write that they came up under the roof without a sound check, and they went back down with a soul check. And I just think it's... Uh, like they they needed that moment. They needed it after all that time. I think they just needed to have that touching upon each other in that way again. Personal right. opinion, you know. I told you I'm, well, a, I'm an emotional guy. I just I kind of see things different ways. Right. Well, I'll look forward to the movie and all the uh, material that's coming out from from this. I really look forward to it. Warren, I'll give it back to you and Bob. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Phil. Um, Ken, do you uh, have a favorite moment or time period of being on the roof or a favorite song that they sung or anything like that that you would like to mention? Um, Well, uh, you know, the roof was a very small part of my time. But when people say, what's my biggest moment in my history in 30 years with the music business, the roof is so obvious the number one thing and then when i start looking for number two it's so far down the list Mm -hmm. when you get to number two that is you know uh, uh, it's kind of uh, amazing um for some reason i'm not quite sure but something uh don't let me down Mm -hmm. uh yeah i think that was it um gosh i started thinking about these things everything goes into kind of a blurry when i was down stairs in the studio uh, sitting on the floor next to Billy Preston. Uh, I was so in, um, engrossed in watching them and seeing how they played and, and how they worked together and what great musicians they were. People ask me, well, what songs were they working on? And I go, I don't know. That's 50 years ago. I don't even remember now. I just remember, <laughs> again, the emotion of the thing and uh, realizing what a great when they would start to gel into things what a great band they were i never thought of it that way you know just what a great band they were ringo was like the consummate drummer he was so perfect on everything he never got in the way uh he would sit and let everything you know work its way out and it was his turn to go with him then you know and he was very patient and always on the money it felt like right those are the kind of things i remember <laughs> 
That's great. Great memories, that's for sure. Um, yeah. you, you dealt a lot with the Beatles' wives and girlfriends and everything. I'm interested in one particular person, and I want to get, <laughs> get your thoughts on her, and that's uh, Yoko Ono. Um, was yeah. she was she that big of a, a difference in her being around the Beatles and when she wasn't? Well, um, I never saw her um, and was around her when she, she was with you know within a micro centimeter of with John the whole time. Right. Uh, so that's the only demeanor I know. She was very quiet when I was around. You know, she was always listening. You know that when you discuss things with John, that it did get filtered back through Yoko, and then John come back. You know, it would be. Um, I used to say that Yoko Ono could more do more with being silent and quiet than anybody with a million spoken words could do sometimes. And uh, she was always she was very kind to me. Uh, in that uh, she approved things to, after John had passed, she approved things for me to do, to use, you know, uh, and like that. So um, the one thing I say that people say Yoko Ono broke up the Beatles, but I think they're giving her way, way too much credit. There was just a lot of things happening. And yes, she did not help things. It was uncomfortable for the guys. And this is not me saying my opinion. This is, you know, the fact that, that uh, it was uncomfortable for them having her there all the time. Mm -hmm. But uh, there's, I, you know, rock and roll bands break up. When you give, if I always said, if you want to break up a band, give them a number one record, give them a hit. <laughs> because that's the thing that breaks up bands is, mm -hmm. is success. So, here they had uh, lasted longer than most groups, and no group has ever had that many hits and you know success and fame and all that. So, and they were you know having wives now, and their musical tastes are evolving, and they've got this Apple thing on their heads, and and all these things going down. I think it was just a natural evolution. It's about time for them to break up. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, I was in a band when I and there came a time where, where the guys they said, you know what? Let's not. Let's just not do this anymore. I want to move on, you know. And uh, so, um, okay. you have anything to say about the other Beatle wives? Uh, you you mentioned Maureen um, was up on the yeah. roof with you. Um, yeah. How how are they as people? And um, did it make a difference to the Beatles if they were there or not? Um, you know, again, I don't know why they haven't been there, you know, why wasn't Patty there or why wasn't Linda there or, you know, I don't know any of these reasons why they were there. Maureen uh, was a very nice person. Uh, I was invited out to Ringo's house one night and it was just like being uh, in a very homey type place, you know, uh, with, with Maureen, very, very settled and very nice. Linda was incredible and she was just a perfect person for Paul. She was uh, a nice person and she was not flamboyant like some of these other people were. And she was, you know, just a very settling thing for Paul. I think it was a great relationship. So, right. yeah, I liked all the wives. And of course, uh, Patty, uh, George and I and my wife at the time and Patty had spent a lot of time together. So it was just like she was, uh, she came to uh, that party I threw out, her and George came to the party I threw out in Malibu Mountains, Canyon one, one time. Yeah, she was just a, a sweet, sweet person. Her and I got to do a Beatle Fest <laughs> a few years back here, and it was just neat to see her again because I hadn't seen her since then. Anyway, right. yeah, I liked, I liked everybody. And so, Ken, I know, of course, uh, you know, with the uh, COVID and all, nobody's doing a whole lot, but what are, are you still, you know, when, when things get back to, I guess, sort of normal, are you still out uh, doing any, like, out speaking, doing any uh, any things promoting your books? Uh, are you doing any of those kind of things? No, and what's interesting, Phil, is this, this is the year that I stopped all that. Okay. And uh, uh, it's uh, it just it comes a time, you know, when... Uh, 
you you got to get off the road and you got to just kind of settle down for a while. And uh, I think um, that maybe that's why earlier, Phil, I referred to this 50th anniversary of being the last four, you know, all four guys anniversary thing they did. And maybe that's why it's it's hitting me that way because I've kind of wrapped things up and I feel that, you know, a lot of happened. A lot, there's a lot has happened with the guys after this, you know, musically and all these kind of things. But I don't know. There's something about this. Uh, this year was just a line in the sand for me. Right. Thank you. Nobody's ever asked me that. Nobody's ever asked me that question before, and I haven't even thought much about it myself. You know, <laughs> right. I just wound down. You know, I'm doing the, I'm doing the interviews for this thing, uh, and. Uh, I just think it's important that that I I kind of leave with letting people know what it just felt like in a way. That's my well. It's been very mission. interesting. It's been very interesting, and Thank it's been you. good to talk to you. Thank you. Okay, Warren. Okay, guys. Okay, Ken. Um, I got one more question for you, and then <laughs> you always have one more. <laughs> <laughs> and then you can. Uh, of you can tell the listeners where to find your uh, books and uh, okay. and find yeah. you online. Yeah, um, right now is a good time to buy uh, specifically the roof from Amazon.com because it's what's going on with everything with shipping and stuff. If you want an autograph copy, uh, my website is MainMansfield.com, M-A-I-N-M-A-N-S-F-I-E-L-D.com. And you can order from there. And, uh, you know, I love autographing the books. So if you'd rather have one that's autographed, go that way. But either way is good. Uh, it's easy. So if you're All an right. Amazon fan and used to doing that, do that. Or, right. Or either way, I'm good. And I just uh, hope you enjoy it. That's all. Right. It was very right. special. By the way, and I'm now I'm rattling on after I said that. Uh, but... Um, I wasn't going to write this book, and in a way, I didn't want to write this book. I just felt like I'd written two books before about the Beatles, and I thought I just needed to, you know, let it go at that. But I got so much people, so many people asking me to, and uh, a very famous author, friend of mine, said that to me. And the reason, when he said it, like a put it in a different level like maybe there's something i should do so i thought well i'll write a couple chapters and just see how it feels and when i started it which is went from beginning to end i had a reason for writing it i had an approach for writing it uh it was easy to write a lot of times when you're writing a beetle book you really there's a lot of hard work involved because there's so many facts and so many details and so many things and you know you've got you guys and everybody knows 10 times more about the Beatles than I do, you know? And so, but this just, this book just uh, came in. I was really glad I did. And so anyway, mainmansfield.com or amazon.com. I appreciate that very much. And thank you for coming on and being on. Thank the you show guys camp. for having me on. Uh, no, and thank it's you. always great. Right. For- Always nice to talk to you. But, um, yeah. Just thanks for being on today. Thank you, Bob. God All right. bless you. Peace and be well in these crazy times. And it's always nice to talk to you, Ken. I, I enjoy your stories, and I love your book, The Roof. And I think it's great. And I got my own autographed copy, and I appreciate yes, what you you've written in it. <laughs> I appreciate yeah. it, and it's nice to talk okay. to you. Nice to talk to you guys. All right. And have a great rest of the weekend. You too. And, and you also. And Bob, be safe. You, 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 yeah. Nice to meet hey. you, Phil. And yes. Enjoyed it. Bob, 